um, my name is Gronia Humphreys. I'm the festival director of the Virgin Media Dublin International Film Festival. And like so many of you, I've been uh, trapped at home waiting and thinking about when I'll see my next film uh, in the cinema, when I'll see uh, something on a large screen that I can't control. And that big cinema experience that in a way I think has, has kind of fueled so many uh, good experiences in my life. And when I asked people about the films that they had, I suppose, loved and really that stood out, um, one film came back again and again and again. Um, I'm delighted that it was actually a film that we screened uh, in the film festival. Uh, it was an audience award winner. And uh, for many people, when I asked them, uh, they described it as quite simply the best cinema experience I've ever had. Uh, that film in 2012, I, it was a Saturday morning, uh, the 25th of February, and it was a screening of The Raid. And I'm delighted that um, we are joined by Gareth Evans, uh, director of The Raid, um, The Raid 2, Apostle, and most recently actually um, of Gangs of London. And uh, I wanted to really celebrate, as I said, the fact that we're going back to the cinema, but I wanted to also bring in some of the people who were at that screening. And uh, in a way, it feels like a kind of circle and we're just having a chat after the screening itself, because uh, in kind of brief conversations with each of them, they can remember so pinpoint accuracy about that screening and their memories of, of, of this great experience between audience and, and, uh, and cinema. So I'm delighted that we have um, Charlene uh, Leiden, who is the uh, film programmer for The Lighthouse and for The Palos. Um, we have David O'Callaghan, who uh, has a day job in Eason's, but is probably, I think, one of our, our kind of long, longest season ticket holders and a kind of uh, film nut. Uh, John McGuire, film critic at Sunday Business Post, who also hosted the Q&A with Gareth. And Liam Ryan, um, film producer, but was also back then our production manager for the festival. And we're gonna try over the next kind of 25 minutes or so to give you a, a flavor of what it was like to be at that screening on that Saturday morning in the Savoy. So maybe Gareth, if I could maybe start up because I know the journey from uh, Swansea to Jakarta has been kind of covered a lot, but maybe if you could take it, take us from, from you know, background to your career, but bringing us up to Tor Toronto, which is where I actually saw the raid and, and we decided to, to, to include it in Dublin. Yeah, so um, I mean, I started off as a kid growing up in a small village in Hirawain in Wales. Um, you know, had parents that were interested in film. My dad was obviously a big film nut, a computer teacher by profession. And like, you know, every weekend was a trip to the video store. And so every weekend was kind of discovering something new. You had, you had pretty wide tastes and whether they'd be, um, you know, American blockbusters or, or sort of um, art house films, world cinema. And so I kind of grew up having quite a rich sort of body of work to watch, you know, a, a good, my dad enthused about Nikita when I was too young to watch it myself. So I knew this French film existed that I had to track down at a certain point. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, every weekend was a, was a trip to the rugby game and then also to the video shop on the way back and pick up a film to watch. And that invariably ended up becoming um, my introduction to martial arts cinema through Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan. And then you know, expanded into the works by John Woo. And, and my dad, again, was a big sort of fan of John Woo's and uh, a massive fan of Peck and Paul before him. And so it was kind of like this education throughout my childhood all the way through then. I didn't, uh, I didn't actually get to have a camcorder till I was about 18 years old. I think that was like all my friends were like, you know, wanting to get a car, uh, like a second-hand car that they could drive. And I didn't bother doing my test. I just wanted a camera. I just wanted the camcorder to actually film something. So for about you know, 17, 18 years of my life, I was just constantly wanting to be able to explore and play around with cameras and figure something out. And so it wasn't until uni then when I met Matt Flannery, who became uh, my DP on all mm -hmm. the stuff I've done, that um, I was making short films. And then I was, at one point I was like, oh, can you, can you hold this camera? Can you do this shot for me? And because Matt had an interest in uh, both creative writing, but also photography in university. And so that started our sort of friendship and then working relationship then from there. Um, and so we made a lot of short films, none of which you're going to get to see ever. Uh, <laughs> and, then, um, and, then, and then we both went on this, this journey together. We made like a, a first independent feature called Footsteps back in 2006, 
which was me sort of finding my feet. I took a sabbatical off work for about a month or two in order to go off and make this sort of like super low budget um, art house film. That's, that's what I thought I'd be doing. I thought I'd be doing art house European style movies influenced by Kitano, influenced by King Kiduk and Kashimike and sort of like a bit transgressive and everything else. Um, and then I never really anticipated that I'd do stuff with martial arts. And so, you know, I, I had all this grounding, weirdly, I had all this sort of like teaching that I didn't realize I was absorbing when I was a kid watching these films. And then um, my wife, who's Indonesian, she had connections with a production company that were doing a documentary. I got hired to do a documentary out there. That introduced me to Eco and these amazingly talented, gifted individuals who had studied the, sea, the, the martial arts of Silat. Um, I fell in love with that as a discipline. I, I'd never seen anything like it before. Um, I loved the fluidity of the movement. I kind of recognized that it was something a bit different about this martial art from other martial arts. And I'd never seen it on screen properly before. And it was just one of those things where it was like um, perfect timing, perfect placement. And I was there doing a documentary for six months found out what it was like to live and work out in Indonesia. I wasn't really doing anything to jumpstart my career in the UK. I, you know, I'll hold my hands up to that. I didn't really push enough. Um, did lots of little sort of free work for other companies where it was like loaded footage for editors or that and the other, but I didn't really get my foot in the door. And so then moving out to Indonesia um, put me in the orbit of Eco Weiss and, uh, and a bunch of incredibly skilled fighters and practitioners of the martial arts. We made Maranta, our first film out there, which did okay, got us a bit of recognition. Um, it was a massive learning curve for me. Um, and then that got a theatrical release in Indonesia. Um, and then, and then after sitting on my, my, you know, sitting on my hands for about a month, a year and a half, while we were trying to get a different film funded that we couldn't get the budget for, um, one of our investors told us, "Hey, I can give you X amount um, if you've got a film that you can make for that much. Then let's go ahead and do that." And so I was like, oh, let me have a think. And so then I just started writing the raid. Um, and it was the, 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 the B project. It was the plan, the backup plan. Just like, you know, scribbled up an idea, just thought, oh, this could be quite fun. This could be quite cool. Um, and about a year and a half's worth of frustrations all started getting flooded, up, on, flooded out onto that page then. Um, and it was just this fun thing where I realized that in Maranto, I'd made a very, very traditional martial arts film. Um, you know, kind of, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, the fresh off the boat style thing that Bruce Lee did in The Big Boss and then Tony Jaa did in Ong Bak. And, and, you know, and this wasn't anything new. It was like an, a, a replication of a traditional martial arts story. Um, and then when it came to the raid, then I was just, I was like, oh, you know, I, I, maybe I can break the mold a little bit. Maybe we can play around with what's traditionally a martial arts film. And I realized pretty early on in the design of it that all the films I was referencing weren't necessarily martial arts films, but they were thrillers or horrors. Um, it was things like uh, Wreck or um, you know, uh, Assault and Precinct 13, mm. um, <laughs> Rio Bravo. And then you know, finding all these different genre types that were meshing together in a way that was interesting. And it became a thing where the martial arts was just the action discipline. And so it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was an instant opportunity. And I realized I'm making a zombie film, I think. I was like, I was making a survival mm -hmm. horror film. And it allowed me then to kind of be able to play more with the form of it and, and mess around and just literally throw everything at the screen and hope that it would stick. We made it in a bubble. We had no idea whether it was going to be successful or not. Um, and then um, I remember doing post-production on the film. I was out in Singapore. I think I went, yeah, I went there to, to stay there for a little bit uh, while I was doing some final work on it. Uh, I think it was mainly because I needed the internet connection because back then Jakarta didn't have a great internet connection for me. So I needed to get um, a version of the, of the edited film over to Todd Brown, who was like at XYZ Films, still mm -hmm. is to this day. And he was getting it to Colin Geddes, who was doing the Toronto, Toronto Midnight Film Madness. Festival, Midnight Madness. And I remember being in Singapore uh, awake for about 30 plus hours, watching a render finish, uh, doing some like, so it was like, it was like an offline cut with just like, you know, temp sound effects, temp score and all that lot. And just sending it over to to to, to Todd Brown on like uh, it was probably on Dropbox or something, something ridiculously <laughs> unsecure for now. Um, and then uh, I just be like, oh, can you burn a disc and get it to call in now? Can you can you do that now? Because like I can't get it to him in time otherwise. And mm -hmm. um, and we we sent it over, and then literally it was like I'd been awake for like thirty plus hours. And I remember as soon as that file got in, he said like I've got it. That was when I fell asleep. And then, um, and then I just remember getting a message back later on then that uh, Colin had 
been enthusiastic about the film, thought it was great and wanted to screen it at the festival. And so that was like our first inkling that we might have something here. Um, and then um, really it was this weird thing and it was breakneck pace. We didn't finish post-production on the first film on the Raid one until I, I my memory is probably not too great on this, but I think we were quite close to the, the date when we had to take the print with us to Toronto. Oh my God. Like I, I'm, I'm almost certain we were like, it, it, it wouldn't have been sort of days, but it was definitely weeks. Um, yeah, yeah. And then, and then when, we, when we went to, to, when we got there to Toronto, it was just kind of like, we hadn't, I hadn't even seen the film yet all, all in one go from beginning to end. I'd only seen it in reels. So it's just like, okay, that's reel one, that works. Reel two, that works. Reel three. So it was kind of like this weird situation where I'm stood behind the, the screen at the, at, at the festival, at the, the venue. And um, I think it was the Ryerson. I think it, mm, been. it was, and, um, yeah. And I just remember, like, you know, I'd never really been to a premiere or, or a screening of that size before. I was just sat there and I stood behind the screen waiting to introduce the film. And me and Nico and uh, I think Joe was with me as well behind the screen. And we were just getting ready to go out and say hello to everyone and, and introduce the film. And we were just like, you know, like, I look back now and I see, like, you know, Joe and Nico are kind of like, they're not as, now they're all like GQ models and stuff like that. And back then, <laughs> you know, Joe's rocking his tracksuit and stuff like that. And we're just like, we just, we just turned up not really knowing what we were doing at all. But um, it was a thrilling experience and, 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 yeah, impossible to forget, really. And it was, I think, me, Matt, Joe, and Nico spent about three hours that night after the screening had finished, just like trolling through Twitter to kind of like see what people were reacting with. Yeah. And, and it was just insane. So, yeah. So I just want to ask one question just about, about the structure of the film, because it, I think it's really interesting that you didn't see it in its entirety, is, is that I, I kept thinking about, you know, the big sort of action sequence, and then there's you know, this long, slow, boring bit that seemed to be sort of the, the way that I'd seen a lot of kind of martial arts films. But this kept building, and it was mm -hmm. a really interesting kind of structure that it never, never flagged, just kept going, and the kind of pace got higher and higher. So I'm, I'm fascinated that you didn't actually see it all in one block. Do you know what I mean? In order to be able to gauge that, well, I, kind of, or was that in the script? I would have, I would have, I mean, I would have, I, I saw it in the, like, in like an offline version. I, I'd watched that film okay. a bunch of times, but in terms of the final, final print, like the actual one that we would take into the festival, no. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'd just, <laughs> it'd be like, okay, well, that reel's good. We're good. We're happy. <laughs> we just didn't have time to sit down and watch the whole thing. You know, so we never did a like a big check print of the whole film in one go. So I was just kind of like, well, look, each individual print is good. We're happy. Let's move on and let's, let's, let's get it out there now. So it was, it was insane. But yeah. And had Eco seen himself on screen? Cause you met him when he was a delivery guy, wasn't he? Yeah, well, I mean, Eco, yeah, I met Eco. He was, um, he was kind of like, he was, yeah, he worked for an office and part of his job was kind of like delivering documents back and forth between different branches, I guess um and uh and and he obviously we had done Maranto before that so he'd had a taste of it um and we took Maranto to Korea I think we went to the Pifan in Pushan so we went there for that um and so he had a taste of it but nothing prepared us for what happened when it came to the raid because it was just it was insane mm. it was just it was nuts and you yeah, know we yeah. it was a bit of a whirlwind thing as well because it was the with with Maranto it, it kind of like it got picked up by lots of different territories, but then it was kind of like, we're okay. We don't need you to come over. <laughs> you know, we just, we, the film will just come out. It's coming out on DVD soon. You know, you, you, if you can just post about it, that'll be fine and everything else. And then when it came to the raid, then suddenly it was like, oh, we need you to do press. Sure, 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 sure. And then before I knew it, me and Nico were kind of like, you know, on, on more flights together than I've been on with my own family. So, you know, it's that, that weird thing. <laughs> so I, I, I had read that it was going to be in Toronto and that there were like very much anticipated whatever. And I kind of fought my way into a screening and it, like everybody else, there was just, it was madness. It was literally midnight madness. It was mm -hmm. everybody, it was the, the film that absolutely everybody was talking about. And I talked to Momentum um, who picked it up for the UK. And I said, look, we would absolutely love to show this. And um, I'm, you know, can't wait to see it again myself. And, you know, can we do this? Um, and then we were really delighted actually when they actually said, yeah. yes, this is fits going to fit in. It's all going to work out. And I think you and Ico also went to Glasgow, I think as well at the same right. time, I think. Yeah. So you actually did a whole kind of like, you know, kind of festival tour. Um, yeah. But I had a quick look back to see at some of the other things that we had in the 2012 festival. So we'd had Glenn Close came in, Martin Sheen came in, Al Pacino came in, uh, Mark Wahlberg came in. 
Um, but the film that walked away, I mean, ran away with the audience award was actually The Raid, which is kind of fantastic. <laughs> so I want to just pass over to Liam, because Liam, you were part of that kind of setup for the Saturday morning. Do you remember? And we wanted desperately to put it into the Savoy. Yeah, and like Savoy, for anyone who doesn't know, is a 780 seat auditorium where it was at the time. And yeah, literally Mark Wahlberg had been there the night before. Um, and then there had been some kind of after party to that as well. So there was a lot of foggy heads going to the Savoy that Saturday morning. Um, so I was there in a production capacity, literally to run a sound desk. And then I realized I was there for the intro. And then I went, the next thing on my to-do list was the Q&A. So I went, well, actually, I'm just going to stay here because I would very rarely sit in on a screening. Um, but I went, actually, no, this is a perfect opportunity for me to sit in and on what was almost a 85% capacity house for a Saturday morning, which was brilliant. Um, so my kind of abiding memory and Garrett, I don't know if you remember being introduced, John, who was our front of house manager, was really nervous about trying to get the pronunciation correct on Eco's name. And he kept, per, he kept practicing like Eco Weiss, Eco Weiss. And then he went down in front of this big auditorium and said, you know, join us afterwards. There'll be a Q&A with the star of the film, Eco Weiss, and the director, Garrett. And totally blanked on it. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of got a laugh it from happened. everyone. And then I think that kind of informality what? kind of just set into the screening then. Liam, are you alright? Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. I can hear you. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah, um, sorry. So, yeah, it was just that kind of informality then that, that kind of set in on the screening then that was this like... Like, and I checked in with a lot of people who were there afterwards and I got kind of stories and like even one message here, I'll read to you very quickly, but literally uh, one of the guys who was there, Sean said, it's my favorite ever cinema experience and nothing else has even come close. <laughs> um, he said, you know, a few of us have been out the night before, a bit foggy going in, cobwebs were blown off pretty quickly and the action and the adrenaline was pumping really early on. And that was, uh, as I walked out with, with a good friend of mine, Phil, as well, he said it was the best argument against the, the naysayers who talk about streaming and Netflix and the death of cinema, because he said that was the best shared collective experience by a group of people in a cinema that you wouldn't have if you were streaming that at home yourself. It was just, everyone was there. There was, um, again, one of the girls who was there, I said, what do you remember from the screening? And she said there was... There was a moment where I think and that was the guy on the balcony or watched it. It was really quiet. And then one single guy just went, awesome. And then the whole <laughs> cinema just <laughs> exploded into laughter. So it, it just, everyone coming out was just on this, this fantastic kind of buzz that it was a shared kind of experience. And another memory sticking with me was in the Q&A, a guy stood up to ask a question and he couldn't articulate it. It was like, so how did you, what was the, oh man, that was just great. <laughs> that was just what he came out with. <laughs> That's amazing. And, <laughs> and I love those little experiences too. I mean, like, you know, it's like, it, it was, it, the, the joy of taking the film like that around was just getting those communal reactions. Um, and that, that's what's so special about it. It's like, you know, we were, we were able to kind of sit in and we did sit in on a lot of the screenings because we just loved seeing people react to it because it was, um, it's the absurdity of, you know, you get to see something which is like a little bit shocking or like we, we, we have the cheesy thing where we call them punchlines within the fight scenes, but you know, you build to this thing and then you hit hard with something, but then you cut away and when you cut away. It gives the audience a time to, to either gasp or wince or collectively ooh or ah. Um, and then because it's moving away then onto something else, everyone suddenly is in a space where you've just showed maybe like 100 to 200 people do the exact same reaction as you. And then it becomes funny and it yep. becomes enjoyable and it becomes something you can kind of like get behind. It's like being on a roller coaster ride then. And now that was the, that's the joy obviously of being able to share it with, with, the, with a large group of people. So, yeah. Actually, Dave, I think, don't you have a couple of specific scenes that you actually remember when those standing ovations, these mythical yeah. standing ovations happened? Well, I just, it's like I, I was saying, like I've been to cinemas in America where people whoop at the screen and shout at characters. And, but in the UK and Ireland, it's not as kind of, you know, now and then, but this, I've never like 11 in the morning, as I said, Foggy was definitely the order of the day, but like the, the obviously the death by balcony scene, um, 
absolutely like people were standing mm-hmm. up the back applauding and there was people like it, there were scenes where I call it the death by door splinters the neck whatever you want to call it but like you literally turn to the person beside you and go did, did, did that just happen like did, did, what and as you say it was ratcheting up and adrenaline shot is the only way to describe but god you came out at one o'clock and you didn't know whether to jump on someone or just sit down or because it was just absolutely unbelievable and I, I just as you say to me, it's the most amazing experience I've ever had in the cinema. I've seen a few films in my time, but to me, I was absolutely gobsmacked. And I'll never forget that. And I can remember where I sat and who I was with. And then, um, so, but I just need to know, and I, I, I can't remember, the, the balcony scene. Mm. Like, please tell me that was done on one shot and the guy didn't do it 50 times. Because uh, is, he, or is he alive? Because <laughs> it was just one of those things that you're like, Oh, Mike, I even watched it again the other night. I'm like, no, seriously, like, what? How many times did that happen? He, he, he was definitely alive when I left him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, look, I mean, when we did that, it was, um, we, did a, we did a trick with it where, um, it, obviously, in order to get somebody to bend that unnaturally, yeah. um, we did this thing where we did the first version of that shot where the camera kind of like pan and followed as the guy was being le- leaping off on a wire and landing on crash mats that we placed for him. So we took the wall out, we let him land straight down on crash mats. We had this big sort of like sudden shoom, move down. And then when we got to the point where he would have landed, we just kept the camera there. We locked it on the tripod. And then basically then we had like big ticker tape around the camera. No one is allowed to go anywhere near it. Um, and then the art department very, very carefully took the crash mats out and then reinstated the wall. And then the guy that would be back on a wire and we would like lower him onto his back so his legs would come down one side, lift him up again, roll again, lower him on his bum so his back could go down the other side. And then um, Andy, my genius VFX guy in, in, in Jakarta, um, stitched all three versions together to make it look like one continuous thing. And that was kind of like the gag. That was the thing we always strive to do is that we wanted to make it feel like what we were, what we were doing was like a million times more dangerous than what we actually did. So a lot of the tricks were coming from like you need the theater tricks with sort of like your prop knives and fake blood and stuff like that, or they'd be sort of in camera tricks where I knew I could hide and edit or, or where I knew I could stitch together multiple takes of something to make you think like that, that we'd shot this in some weird gonzo style where you were seeing shit that you shouldn't see. And, and so, you know, that carried over even into like the raid two, like where we did a, a car smashing into a wall and a guy's body flying through the windscreen of it. Like all in a top shot as if it's all one take. But the reality is, is there's a shot for the car smash. There's a shot where the art department then ripped a hole in the, in the, on the windscreen so our stunt guy could now just jump out and land on the, the bonnet. And then another shot where we had the art department throw bits of glass out. And so then we had three shots again. It's just together, make it look like you've seen something that you're like, how did they do that? Or you know, did somebody get really hurt doing that? And that was the thing. It was like, it was fun to kind of present these stunts because we didn't have the same infrastructure that they have in the U S or in like Hong Kong. And so we, we, we look for tricks and things that we could do differently in order to make it look a hell of a lot more dangerous than it actually was then. But um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the answer. Everyone lives. Well, that's what you're telling us. We'll never know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I also remember just the, this, the huge smiles that audiences had coming out of the cinema. I mean, just people feeling like they just watched. And I, I wondered whether part of that felt like they'd watched this wonderfully kind of warm homage to action cinema, because it felt like it wore some of its references so lightly that it brought you in. It didn't feel cynical. And I'm conscious, Charlene, you were at that screening as well, and, and you obviously then you know, uh, got in touch with with um, Gareth to talk about about the films that kind of were influences on the raid. So, h- how was it for you? Well, like I should probably preface this with two things. So, first of all, I'm really not into martial arts films like <laughs> at all. Uh, so, it's really interesting, Gareth, that you said that about like stuff like Rec. Mm. Uh, I'm really mad into horror films. So, actually, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the other thing I should say is that I have a phobia of broken limbs. So uh, what are you doing at that school? <laughs> An actual like proper, I can't watch a battle sequence. I can't watch anything. So, uh, but I like, I just enjoyed that film so, so much. And I went, was absolutely so excited because I, I pay close attention to Midnight Madness in Toronto. Um, and I was just like, oh, this film, this one's for me. I know it is. And that trailer that came out quite early on was just so brilliant. And like me and the girls in work were like, gossiping for ages and when are we going to get to see it and we all booked tickets 
and like the 11 a.m. screening, I remember like not having time to eat breakfast. So I had popcorn for my breakfast and all that kind of, you know, um, and I managed to be quite brave. But my friends who came with me were like literally laughing at me the whole way through the film because I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> um, and like, I just think that it's really it's really interesting to hear you talk about the making of it because it feels so tactile, all of it, like there's nothing in it that feels unreal and that's really great um so when i was speaking to you but when the film was being released about putting on doing something around it for the lighthouse um because i knew this is just our audience are going to love this we're going to replicate four times a day that screening at 11 o'clock in the morning <laughs> dip i uh, don't know if we managed that but um but gareth you kindly put together a really nice season of films for us that we played around the same time as release. And you also gave a little video introduction to each one. And the list of films was like, it was phenomenal. And you did like stuff like Hard Boiled, um, Akira. Akira, yeah. You had, well, we we showed Maranto as well, which was oh, great. Nice. Yeah, um, Project A part two. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Wild Bunch, Shogun Assassin. And I remembered at the time you'd really wanted to do Assault on Precinct 13. But we couldn't get the screening rights for it. So uh, that was a shame because actually that would have been a really good one. But uh, but it's just really great to have context for this film. And going back to what you said, Grania, just about like it, the film wears its references lightly, but they're there and they're they're quite all over the place. Like it's not just it's certainly not your typical, you know, run of the mill film at all. Like there's so much going on with it. There is elements of horror. There is elements of the Western. You mentioned Rio Bravo there. Like that's a really interesting reference as well. So um, so it's it's almost like when you get a really great film and you really want your audience to engage with it, given it that context, mm. it's great. And it's great fun. And they were a great fun bunch of films as well. So that was uh, the one thing that was devastating to me was when, when we had when you had me to p- compile that list. They were all films that I wanted to watch on the big screen. And I was like, <laughs> I remember doing it from Jakarta and I was thinking like, oh man, they're going to get to see Akira on the big screen. Yeah. <laughs> Akira on the big screen. So, yeah. That's the ultimate <laughs> sacrifice, Gareth. Isn't it just, yeah. <laughs> Can I bring in John here? Because I'm, I'm conscious, John, that you, I think, were sitting with Gareth and, and Eco. So you actually were watching him, watching the audience uh, at the at the That's right. But That's right. No, I have... also... Go ahead. Go ahead, Grony, sorry. No, I was just saying that you you then had to, to try and walk into that kind of maelstrom of emotion yeah. and host the Q&A. So you can mm. kind of give us a sense of what it was like when the credits, when the, when the well, credits I hadn't were. seen the I hadn't seen the raid uh, before the screening, which is slightly unusual, but I had watched the trailer and I had an idea of what was going on. I recall getting there early to have a little chat beforehand with Gareth and Eco. And Gareth, as we were walking in to take our seats, Gareth said something like strap in or hang on to your hat or something like that. And I, I was thinking, well, that's confident. You know, that's, that's confident. <laughs> but the place was already packed when we, when we went in. We sat near the back, the three of us in a row. And I have a very clear memory of the wave of electricity that ran through the crowd during the first big action sequence. It, 15 minutes in, I knew there was something unprecedented was happening because it's not something that you feel all the time. I recall the spontaneous rounds of applause, which I had never seen before in any context in an Irish cinema. The energy never dipped for the next hour and 40 minutes or so. And the audience was genuinely on the edge of hysteria towards the end. And the two lads beside me were nudging each other the whole time uh, through the screening. I looked across a couple of times and I could see that Gareth was watching the crowd. He wasn't watching the screen. And uh, I I, I thought that was really interesting because they were going kind of crazy. So, uh, you know, it came to the Q&A uh, and you're kind of walking down from the back of the old Savoy down to the front of the stage and you, people were buzzing. They were literally tingling. And I, I, the only thing I remember saying was asking everybody to just take a breath for a minute. And we were standing on the stage for a good <laughs> 10 seconds while everybody literally sucked up all the oxygen that was left in the room and sat down again. And I was completely caught off guard, if I'm honest. You, you, when it comes to these things, you can do your bit of research, you can write up your few questions, you hope you don't make a bags of it, but when you're faced with 800 people all hooping and hollering and literally with their hair standing on the back of their heads, 
all that preparation goes out the window. So I have no idea what I asked him. I remember asking Gareth the obvious question, what is, what's a Welsh guy doing going to Jakarta and making an action movie? I remember that, and he answered that very graciously. But I don't really remember any of the other questions I asked. Uh, the, the, I, I, I do recall opening it up to the audience, which is usually murder, and usually the last <laughs> thing you want to do. I, I remember doing that very early on in the whole process, after maybe a minute or two. <coughs> Excuse me. Because there was everybody's hand was up. And uh, uh, it, when it came time to wrap it up, then maybe 20 or 25 minutes later, the people were devastated that we couldn't stay there all morning. Uh, that that the, the people groaned and booed when I said, I was getting this from Gronje. Come on, we've got to go. And uh, I think Gareth wanted to go and watch a rugby match. <laughs> yes. Something, something he wanted to do. And uh, people were booing and groaning and saying, no, stay and more questions. There was a guy, uh, a stuntman, an Irish stunt person, a stunt performer. He had a great question, which I can't remember. And there was an MMA fighter who was there. He had a question about the Silpat, the, the uh, martial art, the technical questions. Uh, I recall that, but uh, it's, it's kind of a blur, if I'm honest. Uh, and all I know is that I had never felt anything like it and never seen anything like it. And everybody who put their hands up and asked a question, that was the first thing that most of those people said was, I've never felt anything like that. I've never seen anything like this in a cinema. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, it, it's what, it was one of those things where you expect these kind of things that they have, you know, that they can happen, or, or, but they don't happen. They don't happen very often. And when they do, you can't plan for it. You can't manipulate it. You can't anticipate it. It's like a riot or a supernova. It happens naturally. And that's when people are in a crowd like that and something happens naturally and organically that's a very powerful thing to be a part of and eight years later we can all remember it and uh you know when when it comes time for us to sit down and have a chat like this about it i mean you it brings it brings it back to you just how rare a thing it is and how privileged we were to be there wow Thanks, John. I, I also, uh, it, it's, it's kind of set a standard as well. I mean, I'm always conscious, as I said to, to Garrett when I asked him if he'd join us for this chat, was that so many people have talked about this. It feels like one of those mythical screenings that there was actually about 3,000 people were actually at the screening because <laughs> everybody has their memory of it. But was the idea that there were two standing ovations during the film. And I kind of loved the idea that that's how audiences unable to think of a, of a way, do you know what I mean, to kind of react, kind of stood up and applauded. It's kind of fantastic because it's very rare to get a standing ovation, a kind of double standing ovations probably if you're on your way out and you're a Hollywood legend. But to get two standing ovations while the film is still on screen is kind yeah, of... Yeah, it's crazy. That's, it's that's, crazy. Kind of a, that's kind of special in itself. Um, can I ask, Gareth, from, from your point of view, you said that yourself and Nico went to see lots of screenings. Was there anything that you could tell from the different audiences how they responded to the film? And, and you, you mentioned, I mean, were there certain punchlines that landed in certain countries and, and maybe others that, that, that kind of parts of the film that got responses that you didn't expect? <laughs> yeah, I got a perfect one for that, actually. When we took it back to Indonesia for the release, um, we would kind of like... We would sort of like we'd go around and do a tour of different cinemas and just pop our heads in every now and then and kind of like surprise the audiences and then be like, oh, here's a bunch of free stuff and then make a little sort of like, you know, uh, fuss of the, of the screening. And I remember we sat in one of them and uh, there was the scene where Yayan is facing off against Joe Tazim. It's like Mad Dog against Jacka. And, um, you know, Jacka pulls a knife and then Yayan pulls a gun. And it's this like standoff moment as they sort of like as they go quiet. And then, you know, obviously in the film, like, you know, Yayan gestures for him to stand up and then go into the room. And, and then, you know, he takes, puts a knife away and then, you know, puts the gun away and then they go at it hand to hand. Well, um, for some reason in Indonesia, at this one particular screening, um, someone made a comment thinking, like, when, when Yayan's got him at gunpoint, just literally just said something like, oh, are they going to go in and have sex now? And, and then suddenly, weirdly, it took on a whole other connotation. And then every gesture that Yayan did up <laughs> the ante of it. So it was like, you know, the nudge, nudge. And then they go into the room. Yayan closes the door behind him and then walks over, 
and then puts his gun down and then puts his both hands up and says, this is the thing. And then and it was like, it was like until they started fighting, it was just like, you couldn't break this weird misinterpretation of the whole thing. So, um, you know, maybe we'll do like a Lars von Trier director's cut version of that scene <laughs> something or other for another another time. We can maybe. all watch it with brand new eyes now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, and I was like, oh man, this is supposed to be a tense scene. And it's just like, everyone's just, pissing themselves laughing and, and finding it <laughs> hilarious but yeah that that was that was one unusual read and the other the other time then one other screening that we went to was probably I think it might have been but this might have been the Ray 2 actually this was the Ray 2 because it was a I remember it being a DCP and we did a screening of it. it was like part of our tour around the US and um when we were doing this tour uh we went to this one cinema and it was just again it was like you know turn up do a little Q&A afterwards, you know, just like a small cinema somewhere. Uh, so we went, saw the start of the film with the Ray 2, who's two and a half hours long. So we weren't staying in a lot of those screenings, to be honest, <laughs> with the Ray, it was easier. Um, the Ray 2, like less so. So we'd seen it already like a hundred times and we were like, right, let's stay for the first five, 10 minutes, make sure the sound is right, make sure the picture's fine, go off, we'll grab a bite, tweet, come back, we'll do the Q&A and then we'll hand some posters out. So we go off, do the da, have food, nice little walk around the city. Um, I forget where it was. It might have been San Francisco, I think. I might be wrong. And then we come back and we go into the screen and, and then I walk in and it's during um, the car chase, I think. And it's like super bright and all the colors are washed out. It looks terrible and everything else. And, I, and I'm like, oh my God, what happened? You know, it was fine when we left. Um, and so I'm like, you know, the publicist there, can you, can you speak to the projectionist, please? Because that's like, the picture's terrible. Like it's way out of proportion. Um, and so... Projectionist comes down and it says like, what's the wrong? What's the matter? I'm like, it's too bright to go to turn it down. He goes, oh, well, you know, somebody complained about it being dark. And then we found out that it was the security guard who had just popped their head into the cinema and was like, oh yeah, this is too dark. You want to turn this up? And so the security guard had told the projectionist to turn the brightness all the way up. Oh my Frank God. So far up, there was barely visible. And I was like, oh, um, I was, you know, trying to be still very, very British and very polite. <laughs> Like, what, what what scene was it that, that you felt was too dark and that she said like oh, i don't know the guy was in like a prison cell and then i was like yeah that 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 seems like it's supposed Early. to be dark right and then she said not that dark and then that was it and she just walked away and it was like it was like so these people poor people had sat there and probably watched about an hour and a half of the film way bright super expo overexposed and everything else so so yeah that was that was a fun experience. <laughs> that, that's a dreadful experience. Listen, we've been celebrating, I suppose, the kind of audiences and, and their, their kind of appreciation of watching something on the big screen. But I'm conscious for you as a filmmaker, having watched that film that many times with audiences, were you conscious when you were shooting The Raid uh, too that you needed to do test screenings or were you able to kind of, you know, keep uh, that sense? Of, of your own kind of storytelling aesthetic, you know, intact, or did you need to kind of go to test screenings or to have kind of audience feedback? For the second film, you mean? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, um, for the second, no. Um, I, I'll be honest. I've I've never done a test screening for anything. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm fearful of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's going to happen at some point, but um, so far it's always been sort of like you know. Uh, I trust, I trust, I trust my producing partners a lot. I trust the, the people I work with. I mean, like, you know, for the raid and the raid too, I had um, Aaron Tatakin from XYZ and then Todd Brown as well from XYZ Films, who were both kind of giving me great notes and feedback. And, mm. and you know, and uh, uh, you know, we tightened the film together. We worked on it. We we have arguments over the stuff that I wanted to keep versus the stuff that they wanted to lose. Um, and we came to like you know certain compromises. I think if if everything was in the Ray 2, it would have been like a three hour plus film. It was, we shot way too much stuff. You know, we shot, we, 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 when I look back and they're like, we cut a whole action sequence that took us a week to film. Um, that's just not in the film. And so like in hindsight, yeah, there's probably a little too much fat on it, you know? So, uh, but I've never, I've never had a situation where I've had to do a test screening or something. Maybe it's because I work within a certain budget level where, yeah. It hasn't really been a requirement yet. I'm sure as I progress and do a film which is like a higher budget range, then there might be that. That might be something that gets suggested. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fearful of that a little bit because I feel like there's so many, because a lot of those screenings, or those test screenings, they can happen when a film's not really complete, you know, and you know, yeah. without VFX, without a final sound mix. Like it's just a horrible thing. You don't want to show it to anyone. It's like showing. It's like when I show people the first draft of a script I've written. 
I'm like, oh, okay, I know it's not there yet. There's a lot that needs to be done yet, but let's get let's get it there first before you know before before we start taking over too many you know criticisms of that. And this is not ready to go out into the world yet. So um, yeah, test screens, no, no, never, never ventured into that. And on a vaguely similar topic ish. Uh, one of the things that kind of broke very quickly after the success of the raid was around the idea that somebody felt like it was necessary to remake it. Um, and yet, as far as I know, that hasn't come to pass. Sure it no, hasn't. no, not yet. No, I, I, I mean, the conversations continue to go around about it. Um, <laughs> I'm fairly, fairly honest about my opinion on that and in, in that. <laughs> Yeah, the original scene exists. It's kind yeah, of we don't need another one, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> that, that wasn't what I was going. <laughs> I was like, because <laughs> the first, when they optioned the remake the first, for the first one, it helped me pay for about a week or two of filming on the second one. So I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, I was like, look, if, if it's one of those things, I mean, like, if if a remake comes out and then you know uh, a bunch of people that just did not know about the original suddenly find the original, great new audience members, they get to see what I made. That film will always, always exist. It'll always be there somewhere yeah. for people to find, and it's uh, it's that, that's kind of like the fun of it. And it's like I don't know, it's it's like this. I, I always felt like when it came to the raid one, you know, it wasn't necessarily the concept. It was the it was the sort of like the, the fun we had in designing these crazy action set pieces and then the execution of that. And mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of like it's like a blank canvas in a way. And I remember like you know back in the day when um, I think at one point Joe Carnahan was attached to the project. And I remember like when I got on a phone call with him and he was talking about it and he was like saying like, you know, asking for like, you know, my blessing to go off and do it. And I was like, dude, like, I'm really excited to see what you bring to it. You know, I'm a fan mm -hmm. of his work. I'm a fan of what he's done. I think, you know, I, I'll, I'll never, ever, ever forget the first time I watched the opening of Narc and just being completely blown away by it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was like, well, look, dude, yeah, I'm yeah. really excited to see what you bring to this. I think you'll, you'll create some incredible set pieces that I wouldn't have thought about. And, and it's got, because it's got that blank canvas feel, I think it, it, there's flexibility there to play with it. It can go off in any direction it wants to be. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be much parts. It could just be pure gunplay for the entire film. You know, it could be so many different things. So I think in that respect, uh, like I didn't mind so much. Like if I, did, if, I, if, I, if I had the skill and the ability to make something like Old Boy, then I'd be less enthused about them remaking it. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I always felt like what I did was kind of like, a template that could be taken and, and expanded or, you know, or, or taken in lots of different directions. Garrett, we have a couple of questions here from people. Uh, first one is, what is Garrett's advice for filmmakers starting out on shooting fight scenes with limited resources? Uh, previs. Um, <laughs> so one, one thing uh, I swear by is previs. I, I'll never do it a different way. Um, I, it, I, I don't know what that means on limited resources. Like I've always been quite lucky in terms of I've had, uh, you know, back in Indonesia, Yayan and Nico worked for us in, in the company. We did previs for action sequences for films that were, you know, about to be set up. And so we just, we, 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 we you know, we, all it was was the three of us and a handy cam and a, a room full of crash mats and cardboard boxes and, and rubber props. And then we would just play just fight. Just do the whole thing. Yeah, just do the whole <laughs> thing. Figure it out shot by shot, edit by edit. Um, you know, since then, once I've come back to the UK doing a parcel we did previous, even for the horror action in a parcel, we did the same process. We shoot the previous first. We know exactly how things are going to work, what the cuts are, what the shots are. And then into Gangs of London with the, with the same team, then with Jude yeah. Poyer's stunt team. Um, you know, one of the things we've done recently, we were prepping for a film that we were going to shoot probably in the next month or two, which is not happening now for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, but we had prepped and done a lot of previews for that. And what we did, um, which is a helpful tool actually for somebody who's making something for the first time and in action, is that uh, while I'm still finding the shots, I get everyone to do it 30% of the speed. So, because um, I, you know, I don't want them to go full, full pelt and then I'm trying to figure out the shot and I'm like, oh, sorry, I got the shot wrong. Well, sorry, it's not the right angle. Um, I'll get them to do it 30% first so that everyone's kind of moving slow. I'm able to see where the movement is of like a grip or a lock or a punch or a kick or a throw. And then I can kind of adjust my camera accordingly. I'm finding the shot when I know I'm happy with the shot, then we do it fast. Um, and we do like, we do like an, a 70%, 80% speed version of it. And then that previs will dictate how many shots it takes to get that scene done. Then we split that into like maybe, you know, on, on a proper production level, you can't fire two shots as quickly as you can if you're doing it low budget, weirdly, 
because you have le less things to kind of mess around with in a way. Um, and so, you know, we'll aim for around about on a good day, 15 to 20 shots per day for action on, on a normal day, 10 to 15 is, is our sort of average. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was very fortunate on gangs. I had a great first AD, Liam Locke, who worked with me on that, where we went through, it was me, Matt Flannery, DP, Jude Poyer, stunt coordinator, and Liam, we sat in a room, went through every action scene, stripped it down into every individual shot. So we were like, today we're shooting shots one to 10. Tomorrow mm -hmm. we're shooting shots 11 to 20. And if we get that done, then by the end of day three or day four, we've got our scene done. If we're completely messed up by midway through day three, what shots from day three and four we're going to lose, pull out in order to kind of make it work. And so that's, that's sort of like the, the process. There's always bits of compromise. You'd be surprised at how much choreography, even when we do the previous, there'll be maybe like eight shots from every scene that we've done, which just gets thrown away and dumped. But because we've done the framework, because we've got the previous in place, I know what shots are coming out and I know how to then bridge the bits which are missing together. Mm. So then I can be like, oh, that one shot will tie these two pieces of choreography together. But it's all collaboration discussion with the DP, with the stunt coordinator, with your AD. And that's the paramount thing is communication really as well. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely, <laughs> it absolutely showed in, in Gangs of London. I mean, I watched that going, oh my God, I've never seen this on the telly. Do you know what I mean? In a, in a TV show, <laughs> it was kind of like, wow, you know? Um, <laughs> another question, um, how did the pairing of Mike Shinoda and Joe Trapanese come about in the soundtrack? That's from Andrew Hanley. In the first one, that would have been through Sony Pictures Classics. So um, they, they, were, they, they, they picked up the film very early on. Um, uh, they, they picked it up at Cannes. I think they were one of the first distributors to pick it up um, at the Cannes film market. Uh, and we were still shooting at the time. I remember, I remember we, were, we were filming because we, what we did was we sent, I sent them offline cuts of three fight sequences um and we did a mock-up trailer or something or other i remember just sending that out to to be shown on like a laptop or something it wasn't like a proper like it wasn't like a film market screening thing it was just just xyz would just have it to be able to show it to prospective buyers oh this is something coming down the pipe and i was filming the scene with Tama in his office of all the monitors when he's about mm. to stab the brother in the hand and I remember we were shooting that sequence and I was sat on the monitor outside and I just remember getting like my phone was buzzing in my pocket. Um, and then I checked it and it was like, Todd, Todd was telling me, or Aaron was telling me, one of the guys, it must have been Todd actually said, uh, film just sold to Sony Pictures Classics. And then I was that's just like, amazing news. And I was like, and I was like, I was like, well, that's good. <laughs> I had to put my phone back in my pocket. And then, and then it was like, <laughs> it was this weird thing. And where I was like, because because we didn't know what was going to happen with the film, I remember just saying to Matt, who was like, you know, getting ready to lens up for the next shot, and I was like, um, I think this means we're a studio film now, <laughs> and so we were we were just like we were like, do we shoot this differently now? Do we need to up our game? Um, <laughs> and so we had to carry on then and finish the film then with that sort of percolating in the back of my mind. But sorry, I w went off on a tangent. Sony Pictures Classics when they picked it up one of the things that they wanted to do was to kind of like, they were like, oh, we love the original, but we want to do something that we can use to market it in the US. So I think they reached out to, to, to Mike Shinoda and then Joe Trapanese. And I think, I think Mike had worked with Joe Trapanese before. They were, they were in each other's orbit anyway. And so they came together to work on, on the score for the film then on the alternate score for the film. Obviously, it was a bit like, I, I, you know, massively thrilled to have two talented musicians working on the film. But at the same time, it puts me in an awkward conversation and with my original composers. From the the who I love the bits <laughs> and I love the work they did, you know. And then, so I always jokingly tell them and, and mess around. I was like, you know what? I, for, for, for this scene, I love your track. But for this scene, I like their track. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm very pragmatic. It's 50 50 boys. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm just conscious of time because we've actually run over from what I, I kind of promised everybody here. But as I said, maybe just to go back to the beginning and, and say, you know, that we wanted to kind of celebrate, you know, the experience of going to see films in, in cinemas and, and hopefully we'll all be doing it really soon. And I suppose I just wanted to go around everybody and, and ask them if there was one thing they were really looking forward to seeing in hopefully the coming months. Charlene. Oh God, me first. God, uh, so many things. Well, like I'm very, very interested in Dune. That's mm. and obviously I, I'm really excited for the new Wes Anderson as well. But like, 
Um, Dune has me so intrigued because I'm actually one of the few people who's a massive fan of David Lynch's Dune. I love it. It's like a little comfort for me. I love it so much. Um, but I also see how that can be done very differently and perhaps better. Um, I love Denis Villeneuve, so I'm really excited about that. And it feels like a really big cinematic event. I'm really looking forward to that. So that that that's my that's my main one for now. Okay, Dave, have you got anything uh, lined up? That's yeah. I think uh, for me, uh, Peninsula, the last train to Busan presents. I suppose you'd call it, but um, purely because actually it's funny. Last Trade to Busan is probably the only other time I've had a stressful experience like that day. And it's basically the raid on a train with zombies. So, um, but yeah, Peninsula just looks fascinating and it should be, probably won't be as good, but I don't care. Horror, I mean, so yeah. Uh, Liam? Uh, Tenet. Tenet, IMAX, <laughs> biggest screen I can it. find. <laughs> the, the way Nolan intended. On your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> John, what what have you got? What's what's? I don't care. I don't care what it is, Claudia. I genuinely don't care what it is. I just can't watch another movie. Here no, I can't either. On this screen. On I, this screen. Uh, yeah. I don't care what it is. I like to. I like the sound of Dune. I'm really anticipating Tenet. I think my background in theoretical physics will be handy when it comes to that. Uh, I'm really interested in. Uh, Peninsula as well, and the new Wes Anderson. I mean, I don't. I just want to go back. I've we've, yeah. it's been too long, and uh, I just want to get back and sit down. Uh, press screenings are uh, a privilege, really, uh, and it's only now that you realise just how privileged you are to get to see these great films and uh, in comfort, in almost silence, away from the public, unfortunately. But you know, it's 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 such a privilege to be able to write and to watch and to write about film. Uh, and we, I really felt that over the last couple of months because mm. the stuff we've had to watch, just, you know, a lot of it just uh, hasn't been the same. It hasn't been the same. No, but soon, but soon. Um, soon. And, and back to you, Garrett, now. I've given you a bit of time so you can come up with your, <laughs> with your, with, with your nomination. But there's a question, while you're thinking, there's a question here. Who is the crow holding hands with behind oh, Garrett? that's... <laughs> They're not supposed to be holding hands. I think that's a perspective shift, but um, that's Golgo, Golgo 13, uh, Japanese anime character, <laughs> famous manga character from uh, about four years They look years like old. they're in a musical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the crow's got a guitar, so this, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. Um, I'd watch and, that. <laughs> and that's Mad Max's car then as well next to it. So yeah, so that's good. <laughs> so there you go, Daniel Anderson. There's your, there's your question answered. Uh, so, Garrett, what are you most looking forward to? Um, I'll be honest, Tenet has been on my list. I've been desperate to see that. Um, I, I have this thing now of like, because I, I, I tend to avoid trailers as much as possible now. Um, I avoided the trailer for Parasite and then just fell in love with that film entirely. Um, mm. And so I was glad I kind of avoided the trailer for that. I did see a teaser trailer for Tenet and I was like, I don't want to know anymore. I just don't, I just, I just, I just want to see it. I just want to experience the film. As much mm -hmm. as possible. I've been, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I've been watching a lot of old films lately, and I've been kind of like, there's certain films that I wish would get somehow in some magical realm, get another screen in or something or on the big screen. Um, I've been deep diving into uh, Shohei Mamura's films from Japan from the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s lately, and I've been, I, I, I just watched Vengeance is Mine for the first time on the weekend, which was phenomenal. Um, so I'm kind of like absolutely obsessing over him. So you know, on the off chance that somehow, somewhere, a cineplex near me decides to do a, an Imamura <laughs> retrospective, I'll be happy. All right. Well, that's coming out of this entire conversation now, is that's what Garrett, Garrett Evans wants for Christmas, is an Imamura. It's a cinema. He's nominate what cinema. His own cinema. It'll be one for sale, too, as well, Garrett. Yeah. <laughs> listen, on that note, listen, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody, uh, to Charlene, to Dave, to John, to Liam, and a huge thank you, Garrett, for giving your time to, to talk, as I said, to reminisce on a, a very special morning in Dublin uh, eight years ago. Uh, it was a really special event for not just us, but for many, many other people, uh, many of whom I, I know are actually sending in um, messages and, and questions about, about the screening. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I'll be in touch when we have another one lined up. But as I said, uh, thanks for joining us. Take care. Brilliant.
Great. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Any ovation is required. <laughs>